So the next speaker is Shai Gordin, who is well known among Hittitologists by his work on Hittite scribes, um, oh. which I really can recommend. And he is now uh, in, uh, at the University of Ariel and in the, in the university it's called uh, what is it, Open University of Israel and they are uh, uh, a visiting professor in digital humanities and social sciences hub. He is now working with, uh, uh, in, and he is also coordinator of the Digital Engine Near Eastern Studies Network, DANES which I had the pleasure to attend in some workshops. Um, and now he is uh, trying some new things, with, especially with a, a, um, language processing. Uh, and it's ancient language processing, what he does. And I think something like that he will present today to us. Um, can you switch him on? Is your eye online? Yes. Ah, thanks, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, very good. Ah, so you, you, you can... You. Just a moment, Shai, uh, we need your picture. Uh, remove pin, I think. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Here you are. Very yes. good. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> there are no crocodiles in the background then. <laughs> not, not in the, in the canal of Babylon. All right, okay. <laughs> So it would be, it wouldn't be nice to find one of those dinner dates. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, like, yeah. So welcome to the conference, and uh, we're you. looking forward for your contribution. Thank you. Can I share my screen? Yeah. And, uh, okay. Great. Okay. And you can see it, right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, perfect. So hi everyone. Sorry for not being there uh, to enjoy this wonderful conference in person. And I wish to thank first Marina for inviting me and for the opportunity to honor Silidin's memory, uh, who I met on several occasions, uh, also in mind, and especially his long-lasting legacy on the field of digital engineering and studies, which Gertrude just mentioned. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, I studied with inscribable habits. The identification of relevant tablet fragments for each scribe and creation of a working index with accompanying images of the text, as well as bibliography, was at the time a luxury of ecology. Few disciplines studying the ancient world could boast something similar to the Concordant Edition Kyle Shirtahi. Originally offered by Sylvan in book form, it became one of the basic online research tools of the early 2000s a primordial internet landscape that was only beginning to form around scholarship, soon to be popularized under the umbrella term digital humanities. This endeavor, as we heard yesterday evening and just now, was centered around the laboratory work done in the physical mind faculty, whose expert members worked tirelessly to establish one of the first ancient digital corpora in existence. In fact, one could argue that the modern archival work in mind allowed the creation of a data set that dealt with a process known in archival science as archivalization, to quote, the process of determining or sensing that a record has the necessary qualities for it to become part of an archive or to be archival, end quote. Sylvian Pocodans reflects this in its ontological structure. The basic identifying elements of each tablet fragment called inventory number, is the excavation or catalog number, which provides an immediate connection to the archaeological context and its reconstruction. The catalog then provides a physical or tentative connection of each fragment to other fragments, images and copies, the classification of genres and text types, known fine place periodization, and bibliographical notes. In this fashion, Sylvain's Concordat is an attempt to index ancient struggle technical and mental processes understanding both the conscious and subconscious actions that go into the preparation of documentment of archivalization. This modern archivalization process is the first step in tracing the ancient, the ancient archivalization processes, some of which are impossible when using traditional theological methods. In this talk in honor of Citizens' foundational work, 
I would like to present what I see as the next steps in computational research of ancient languages. This is part of what I define as the ancient language processing, a subfield of both computer science and ancient history that aims to establish new research questions and develop quantitative methodologies and measurable hypotheses for the challenges faced when studying ancient languages and cultures computationally. I will focus on how to bring new perspectives on age-old questions in ancient archivalization procedures, thanks to the modern digital archivalization practices of the last 30 years. But first, let us raise a working hypothesis. I would suggest to view this archivalization process through what I call here the agent-document relationship. The agents performing this process need not be expert scribes or clerks, and can be ordinary people from different walks of life, as well as institutions, following some form of scribal training. Note that I am purposefully avoiding the placement of the archivalization process, as it is considered more of a mental and social exercise than one attached to a physical location. Instead, I would like to focus on elements of the archivalization process that we can more confidently reconstruct. The use of the term archivalization in its ancient context is deliberate and refers to the possibility that not all the ancient documents in question were created and handled by the rules of an institutional body, but rather by groups of rational agents who could also follow their own experience and internal communal and social norms. Now, in order to better understand this oversimplification I just made from the agent document relationship, I need to explain one more term operationalization. Operationalization following Moetti is a methodology for experimentation based on a measurable hypothesis. It is a series of operations required to move from the abstract concepts that we use to describe culture into measurable metrics. For example, counting words to determine central topics in a text, or in our case, formally different ways to quantify what makes a certain document authentic in the eyes of a certain agent. Historically, this type of analysis goes back to Greek or Roman libraries and later medieval scriptoria in order to verify the authenticity of traditional compositions and the legal authority of institutional and archival records. It were Mabillon and other French abbeys in the 17th century CE, however, that consistently used paleography and related methods of document verification to establish the origin and age of a given document, thus creating the science of diplomatics. As a study of the genesis and nature of archival documents, diplomatics stresses how and why there were rules and standards which govern scribal habits, which are reflected in the form of documents, both on the physical and intellectual level. In Cuneiform studies, European continental schools were first to adapt terminology of diplomatics, also Okundanlewe, advocating to look at Cuneiform tablets as artifacts. They have proven the existence of synchronic and diachronic rules and standards for Cuneiform documents of all kinds, from the earliest organic tablets to the last remnants from the first century CE. So it turns out that diplomatics is a scientific method already has tools to approach the complex question of what makes a certain document authentic in the eyes of a certain agent. I will therefore suggest measurable matrices to some of the main analytic steps required by the diplomatic method. To do that, I will present the results of different interdisciplinary studies, mostly collaborations I have with scholars in computer science and their archaeological sciences. They can be divided into three groups according to the distance from which they look at the large corpora of cuneiform documents and described artifacts. This distance is aptly envisaged here through the metaphors of the telescope, the topography, and the microscope. Imagine you had a very strong telescope that allowed you to look at 100,000 cuneiform tablets all at once and tell you something meaningful about the archivalization process over time and space. This is the objective of a joint study led by my Miami student, Daniel, which aims to uncover the subtle distinctions in tablet shapes that are indicative of various historical periods or genres. Usually, the study of tablet shape is done by acquiring a large data set of measure or measurements for tablet height and width. However, even 
Anecdote to connect from Digital Library Initiative of CDLI holds tablet measurements and instruction metadata for literally tens of thousands of tablets, and the data is accessible in bulk. The numbers are simply not robust enough for a systematic study. Many measurements are partial, and for some periods they don't exist at all. Instead, we turn to the almost 100,000 tablet images made available for CDLI. The images are of a rather uniform quality scan with flatbed technology and made into so-called fat process. This provides composite views of each tablet, thus offering an approximation of a three-dimensional shape within the confines of two-dimensional imagery. The pie chart in front of you is a distribution of available tablet images according to period. After data cleaning and pre-processing, we are left with close to 95,000 2D tablet images. Almost 75% of the images are closely divided between the Ur-3 Neo-Assyrian and all the belonging periods, while all other periods are closely distributed in the remaining 25%. The data set includes all genres together, but the majority of texts from each period are, of course, the administrative and archival texts. We train the machine learning model, specifically a deep learning model, with thousands of labeled images, and then we tested it on images the model has not seen before. We use the labels of the unseen images to assess the success of the model. This is what you see in the table before you, where there is a division into historical and chronological periods. The F1 column shows the overall result of the model. It, it not only classified certain periods between 80% and 100%, but on average the accuracy of the model is 87%. This model, however, is a black box that does not give us an explanation for its prediction. In order to understand what the model is seeing, we employed methods of explainable AI, namely examining different quantitative measures and different inputs to the model to understand what the model bases its decisions on. In the language of computer science, this is attempting to find the region of interest. One way to do this is by retraining the model only on binary images, where the background is black and the tablet is white. The writing itself is not used to predict the period or genre. In humanistic or astrological terms, this was a way to test whether the model was looking at the signs or at the shape of the tablet. The marginal drop in success rates, 79% compared to the previous 87%, was surprising and show that it is probably the ratio or shape of the tablet that provides the most indicative clue to the model above all else. Another method of explainable AI is examining the last hidden there of the model, the last thing the model sees before making its prediction. In this case, we visualize this last there in a 2D scatter plot, which shows the relative similarity or dissimilarity of the tablets from one another. It is clear that there are very distinct periods, for example, there were three, a period of neo Assyrian, while in other periods, tablets are more similar to each other in terms of form. But can we further divide into the dive into the quantitative reasons behind these tablet classifications? And I think the answer is yes. We use the silhouette images to extract the height to weight ratio. While we do not have the exact measurement through the, through the images, that does not affect the actual ratio here. So we separated each component of the silhouette image, and then chose the largest component between the obverse and reverse of each tablet. The results are presented in the following box plot, in which the y-axis represents the calculated ratio, and the x-axis represents the period in chronological sequence. Periods for which there were less than 100 tablets were removed from the analysis. To better follow my interpretation, please note the arithmetic median in each of the boxes, the line inside the boxes, marked with a red arrow, for example, to the group 3 period here, as well as the upper box line, over which only 45% of the examples are tested. For example, in Ebla, this is marked with a yellow arrow. I believe this is the first time there has been such a robust visualization of cuneiform tablet shapes that covered the entire history of cuneiform writing. The analysis is indebted first and foremost to the hard work of Englund and the compilers of the CDLI image dataset over many years. 
The study itself is still ongoing, but the results uh, of the ratio analysis can be summarized as follows. When attempted sizes obviously differ quite extensively for astronomy, place, and between genres, most social agents who produce cuneiform tablets of the landscape variety had in their mind a standard ratio between 3 to 5 and 3 to 4. Chronologically or spatially related writing traditions show an even closer relationship than, for example, the rule 3 through all the belonging in to middle Babylonian periods. This explains the known relation between tablet shape and archival context. For example, in a recent study of neo Babylonian and Achaemenid tablet shapes from Uruk and Sipar conducted by Mirkadiosa. Most interesting are the outliers like Ebla and Middle Elamite, which show the development of different standards much closer to a tablet ratio of one, namely almost square tablets. Now, Assyrian shows a similar higher ratio with a median of 5 to 6 and a maximum of 3 to 2, which reflect the different standards of Assyrian archivalization, using a larger variety of landscape formats, as well as a higher percentage of portrait shaped legal documents. The neo Assyrian image dataset also includes a large number of fragments, which did not seem to have had a serious influence on the results, but we will test this in the final publication. Last, lastly, smaller boxes mean much less variation in tablet shape, and therefore a more strict or centralized control over the agent document relationship. Now, surprisingly, Ural 3 shows an impressive centralization effort, which is well known, but still comforting to observe quantitatively especially since it is also the largest image data set in our corpus. Another way to visualize the variance in, in, that we just saw is reconstructing the average tablet silhouette, which is what you now see before you. Based on all tablet images, we use a neural network known as the Variational Auto Encoder, or VAE for short, which boils down the visual essence of a tablet silhouette and can then compute the mean or average tablet for a specific period or genre. The more blurry an image, the less consistent the tablet shapes for the genre and period. The sharper the image, the more consistent the shape. It is clear to see that one of the sharper images is that of Uru 3, but compare that with the average administrative tablet of Ebla or from the Achaemenid period. And this shows again the variability in the tablet shapes from a distant telescope. This example shows you some of the quantitative analyses we can do with digital data. Imagine what can be done if we could link the information of tablet shape and format with the use of certain envelope types, ceiling habits, or text variants. This would help craft a more representative spatial and chronological narrative that binds, for example, with a close reading of legal, administrative, and political processes. Our ability to closely and systematically measure traces on the surface of cuneiform tablets or other inscribed artifacts is mostly limited by the way we digitally record and model. While this process can be limited by access to the objects, funds, and equipment, as well as institutional copyrights, there are by now well established methods and processes to choose from. And the variety and sophistication of the methods seems to keep growing by the year. And in this part of my talk, I will briefly describe some of my work on creating 3D models of cuneiform tablets, their advantages to the kind of quantitative research presented above, and how they relate to further studies that can be done on the signs, seals, and other markings on the tablets. Methods for recording cuneiform tablets have been improving significantly in the past few years. Documenting cuneiform tablets has always been a challenge in the past. 3D objects simply cannot be represented with all of its information and complexity in 2D formats like hand copies or regular images. Each of the imaging methods shown in the slide illuminate the cuneiform object with different intensities and from different directions. So it's this one. While it seems obvious that HDR is a good method of photography, it is the use of dynamic multi-light RTI that is currently considered the state of the art in recording cuneiform objects. Yet with all its advantages moving forward, especially with new AI applications, there exists a strong case for 3D imaging techniques. The advantage of 3D models over the above imaging techniques is that they are the only format to date that can fully represent every aspect of the connected tablet. Furthermore, these formats are usable in the Gigamesh program developed by Hubert Mala over a decade ago. It is not proprietary and is still fully supported. 
One can upload the 3D model of the print from tablet and get exact measurements of the tablet in all these directions and improve the visibility of what is barely seen with the naked eye. With a 3D scan of sufficient quality, it is possible to measure the exact depth of wedges and seal impressions, create 10 copies automatically that are an exact representation of the size of the tablet, and find further details of the clearly such as fingerprint and nail impressions. Take, for example, this forgery document detailing the state of some barley sealed by the wife of the known witch shepherd Sia. You can see the traditional images and hand copy prepared for this document. Already on the image, it is possible to see ceilings impressed all over the tablet. However, the hand copy presents the seal impression only once. And this is not to blame the copies, as copying every representation of the ceiling of the tablet would have made the text itself illegible. Even when looking at the image, however, it is difficult to tell how many times the ceiling will repeat itself and what is the arrangement of the different impressions. When highlighting the minute impressions on the clay using Gigamesh, for example, it is possible to highlight the underlying impressions and barely visible signs. This makes it easier to decipher them, measure, and record tracing. It is computationally best practice for separating different levels of traces, be they exact, be, be they text or seedings, enhancing the visibility of both. Another important aspect of which 3D models will be a must is the study of fingerprint impressions. A recent study of dermatoglyphics, epidermal fingerprints found on the surface of ceramic artifacts from Tel Burna, was able to show the participation of female potterers in the production process of this ancient revival industry. This is just the latest of many studies in recent years studying at the turn of the century for studying fingerprint impressions to identify the sex and age of the agents who produced or touched on objects of study. Previous studies of linear repeat tablets identified 46 individuals, including child apprentices that prepared the clay tablets, and similar studies were performed on the 1400 Mycenaean tablets from Pilos. While mentions of fingerprint impressions of clay from tablets is not lacking in literature, they have yet to be systematically studied. The main technological obstacle pre preventing this kind of research is lack of accurate measurements of friction-rich detail, or FRD, which is the key to identify age and sex. 3D models, together with the Gikamash program, can detect the minute play of breadth and rich density and measure it to the micrometer in a way that human eyes and other measuring tools cannot do systematically. I hope these few examples illustrate to you why we must try to create more 3D models of cuneiform texts, and here again, the hidden logical purpose is actually leading the way, as we just heard yesterday, it has a close to 3,000 3D models in its data set. Using the best technology that is available to represent the document connect from varying artifacts will allow us to connect between writing habits, sign forms, formulae, and the specific individuals who wrote them, reconstructing the way in which they held the tablets, the pressure with which they rolled their seals, and more. Whether tablets were actually fired in antiquity or not is a question that requires serious consideration. When possible, one should take into account the archaeological zitzim label of certain types of texts to better understand how the agents who created them could reuse them. Unfortunately, for many today from archives, the original disposition is complex to reconstruct, if not simply impossible to know. Joseph Muller mentioned yesterday how the color of tablets is an important factor in identifying tablet joints. But even more importantly, one should consider the various temperatures in which different tablets were heated. We are in fact missing a better understanding of the systematic nature of treatment given by different agents to certain types of documents. There is therefore a need to collect as much data as possible, not only on the distance of firing, but especially on its temperature, and as I should claim here also its magnetization. First, one should discuss the limits of the microscope, or in other words, the methods and their limitations. The famous 2004 study of Bowen on the NMR tablets was limited testing done by the methods of the time. This method, called Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy, spectroscopy or FTIR, is an established method that identifies the alteration of clay minerals only by about 500 degrees centigrade. 
As recently as 2019, Roman and colleagues continued their analysis of the firing of some MR tablets, as well as a second group of letters sent from Egypt to Khaki, circa 70 years later. The results presented in the slide use a different non-destructive method that was not available for the 2004 study called Thermal Glovimetric Analysis, or PBGA. PGA measures weight changes in a material as a function of temperature or time under a controlled atmosphere. Its principal uses include measurements of a material's perfectibility and composition. Gohan concludes, and I quote, we may deduce that between the 14th to the 13th centuries BC, Egyptian cuneiform letters and clay have undergone a process of adaptation, resulting in the adoption of more suitable clays and higher, in higher firing temperatures to secure safe arrival of the letters without damage or fraud. Another methodology that has just been established and published by Bakhtin gives us another necessary tool to determine the temperature in which clay objects were found. This is not an estimated temperature below or above 500 degrees, but exact measurements up to a certain high temperature. The method works as follows. I apologize for the technicalities I will, I will just uh, describe now. Clay objects have a natural magnetism. This magnetism is weaker than what is called Thermal, uh, uh, thermal remnant magnetization, or TRM, which is the magnetization that occurs when you fire clay. This magnetization is testament to the heat in which the clay was originally burned. It is possible to detect the exact heat level in the lab setting by overwriting this uh, process with firing <laughs> again. The clay will get heated to a certain temperature, then cool down. And its, and, and its magnetism will be measured. This is repeated again and again each time with a higher temperature until traces of the old magnetism completely disappear from the clay, replaced by the new magnetism from the lab set of fire. This is then the temperature in which it was originally burnt. And this is called the maximum unblocking temperature, or TUV. The limitation of this method is another temperature called the maximum blocking temperature, or TV which depends on the kind of magnetic mineralogy and the grain size distribution of the clay. If the ancient heating was hotter than this maximum blocking temperature, they can only figure out the minimum temperature it was heated to, and not the exact temperature. In their article, they did not study clay tablets, but the results on mud bricks were particularly relevant. They studied closely one of the mud brick structures at Tel Buna, and showed that it used sun dry bricks, not pre-fired bricks. They also showed that sun dried bricks could reach uh, temperatures of 100 degrees centigrade. Another important information that can be reconstructed using the paleomagnetic field is the original date of fire. The direction of the magnetic field, as well as its strength, is dependent on the geomagnetic field of birth at the time, which is reconstructed from multiple ancient findings of secure dates. In a study with colleagues from Tel Aviv, UCL, and San Diego, we studied thermomagnetic field in brick inscriptions of the Mesopotamian kings to add another criterion for the long-standing issue of low, high, and middle chronologies. We correlated the magnetic orientation of bricks of well-known kings in a relative chronology with previous studies from the Levant, Syria, Turkey, and the Dayala region. Samples were collected with agreement on site at the Staman Museum in Kurdistan at the uh, YBC in the United States, and one sample was provided by Akadisi University Excavations. Brick inscriptions were recorded using image-based modeling in order to obtain a high-resolution autograph for documentation, and the readings and interpretation are available on a public repository. Out of 139 samples, 40 were selected for this research from a very detailed range as possible, 32 samples provided sufficient results, and the rest will be sampled in a later research. The plot before you shows the result of the magnetism on the bricks marked in red dots compared to previous research, including the, uh, the Levantine Arctomagnetic Curve, or LAC for short. This curve is based on more than 150 samples from the 3rd to the 1st millennia BCE, with an average of a data point every 20 years. The age ranges along the x-axis provided for each sample, 
represent the length of the reign of the king or dynasty that each baked brick has been associated with on the basis of an inscription. Absolute dating in this graph is according to the low chronology, which results in the best alignment between our data and the lag curve. Historical inscriptions have always been instrumental in archaeological research to synchronize important events like campaigns, the construction of monumental buildings, or the length of a king's reign. But there are very few scientific methods that can help us corroborate the absolute date of an inscription, let alone one that can be independently judged against the possible dates of other dated inscriptions. Quantifying or operationalizing the agent document framework has significant potential in taking us forward in our understanding of the processes our objects went through in their creation and our materialization history. We require combining classic and new methodologies, as well as using new tools for measurements and especially a systematic and ontological way of organizing the data. Humanistic interpretation has always been about debate between different abstract concepts and how they fit or limited fragmentary information. The need to bring the two together in more coherent fashion has never been greater, as the legacy of Stephen teaches us. An honorable agent of the second millennium CE who has shined significant light on the agents of the second millennium BC. Thank you very much.